Well, it's one of Australia's greatest tourist attractions and it's in big trouble. A study of the Great Barrier Reef has discovered half its coral cover has been lost over the past three decades with storm damage most likely to blame. The Australian Institute of Marine Science, though, says there is a way of safeguarding its future. And John Gunn, the CEO, joins us now from our Canberra studio. Many thanks for your time this morning, John. Take us through how extensive this uh, research was to come up with, with what are really alarming results. Beverly, it's, it's by far the world's most comprehensive survey of reef health. Obviously, it's a very big reef. It's involved thousands of days at sea and, and many, many years of our staff time. Uh, we've, we've surveyed this reef over 27 years and as you've have said previously, uh, we've detected that 50% of the coral cover that was there in 1985 is no longer there. Now you also find that in fact 48% of the degradation of the reef, that 50%, so 48% of that 50% is due to storm damage and of course we've had some very major events, uh, particularly around Queensland in the last couple of years. So that is a big one to fight, isn't it? So there's nothing much we can do about storms, Beverly. Uh, I think the reef is, a, is actually built. It's, it's evolved to be able to deal with, with storm damage. Uh, those types of things have happened through the millennia with the Great Barrier Reef. Uh, we know that, that reefs can recover from storm damage. Uh, the real, really um, difficult thing about the data set that we have to hand now is that uh, storms are one factor, 48% of the loss is due to storms. 42% is due to crown of thorns starfish, which is in fact a native pest, and 10% is due to bleaching. And it's the cumulative impacts of these three uh, factors that uh, have had the reef in trouble. Let's talk firstly about the crown of thorns because I must say I was surprised when I read this report because I thought that was something that we had been tackling and, and, and really largely had got on top of, but this clearly is not the case. No, we've never got on top of crown of thorns. We know a lot more than we did. Uh, it, the first outbreaks happened in 1962. Uh, and, and what tends to happen is that it starts up in, in north of Cairns uh, as a major outbreak and then gradually a wave of crown of thorns move down, not migrating, but their larvae flow south with the currents. And uh, they move down the reef and, and sequentially eat out reefs as, the, as they go south. And it takes them a decade to do that. So what happens is at the end of that decade, people have kind of got over the big news that there's a crown of thorns starfish outbreak. And then another one happens uh, a couple of years after the last one's broken down. So how do we, I mean, as you say, unfortunately, people tend to forget about it and we, we avert our eyes from this issue. How do we keep countering the, the, the crown of thorns? So I think there's two, two elements to this. We, we really do believe this is, is something we need to do something about. It's, it's the, one of the things that we can do something about. As I said, we can't, can't really stop the storms. Uh, the bleaching, which is, which is a result of warming of the oceans, is something our government and governments all around the world are trying to, to avert through climate change talks. Crown of thorns is something that we think we should attack on two fronts. Uh, the first is to try and stop the outbreaks happening in the first place. They, they occur after major flood events when, when the rivers of North Queensland bring nutrients down from, from siltation and, and, and uh, from fertilisers. We believe we can stop, at least reduce, uh, the crown of thorns uh, outbreaks in the first place by, by getting our water quality uh, better and better, the less nutrients coming onto the reef. The second attack would be to have something that control them if in fact an outbreak starts up in North Queensland. If we could knock it on the head when it's still in its early phases through biological control and there's some research that's quite promising in that regard uh, coming out of James Cook University at the moment, um, we believe we'd be able to, to knock them off at both ends of, the, uh, of their life cycle. How do you control the water quality though? Well, it's a, there's a wonderful program that the government's running at the moment called Reef Rescue, quite innovative. It's working with farmers to increase uh, uh, the, the care that they take in around the riparian zone. So there's less uh, silt uh, collecting in our rivers and then pouring down into the ocean. And they use less fertilisers. They have much better farming practices that allow them to use less fer um, fertilisers. So that's, that's our control on the land front. It's comforting to hear that because another 10% of this degradation is resulting from bleaching, which I take mm. it also comes through the f from fertilisers and from, uh, 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 is it industry as well, where water, you know, pollutants are going into the water? No, uh, bleaching is a very, very direct result of a very warm events. Okay. So in about 1985, uh, we started to see coral reefs around the world having these sort of warm water events and then bleaching. 
And, and over the years since 1985, unfortunately, as the oceans have warmed, as they have, and as they will continue to do with climate change, uh, we've seen the incidence of, of uh, bleaching events uh, increase and spread more widely around the world. It's happened twice in a big way on the Great Barrier Reef. In, in 1998, we had an event that, in fact, was a worldwide event. Um, it, it hammered our inshore reefs, not so much on the, on the mid-shelf and, and outer shelf reefs, where the, the water is well mixed with oceanic waters. But in 2002, we had a really, really severe bleaching event due to some very, very warm conditions during summer. And it, and it really severely impacted reefs throughout the coral reef. So it comes to that sort of bipartisan support r around climate change again if we're talking about warming events. And that uh, is proving to be a very hard task in, in this country at the moment. Yeah. So uh, <coughs> this government and I think previous, previous arguments have have said that one of the reasons we need to, to fix climate change for Australia in our, in our local context was that if we don't, we won't have a Great Barrier Reef. And this is, this is a truly magnificent icon for Australia. Um, it's worth $5 billion to our tourism industry. Regional centres depend on the Great Barrier Reef. And so there are many, many reasons why we must try and win that, that battle. So, but, but the much bigger issue, of course, that 42% of the crown of thorns, do you feel you're getting the right sort of cooperation to beat it or at least contain it? So as I mentioned, uh, the government is investing a lot of money. $200 million has been, uh, been set aside for reef rescue, uh, assuming that that would be continued. And some of the research the government's recently started to support on the Crown of Thorns too. Yes, I think we've made a good start. I think uh, time will tell exactly whether we need to, to fine tune or even invest further in this type of work. But um, that's something that I know the government's uh, listening to us on.